We are very happy to be sat with the director of the new movie adaptation of The Danish Guy. It's Tom Hooper. Hello, Tom. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? Yeah, Hello. really well. Thank you. A very exciting day today. We've got the premiere tonight of the movie in London at Leicester Square. Um, suggestions also today that Eddie Redmayne, one of the stars of the movie, uh, might collect his second Oscar next year for his portrayal in this movie. Um, well, that's probably a little premature, but uh, any, any buzz that his performance is getting, uh, you know, if it helps people to come and see the film on January the 1st when it's released, then that's fantastic. Yeah, because, of course, um, we, we've seen the film. Catherine's seen the film. Yes. Right. Um, what did you make of it, Catherine? Well, I was going to say, I, I really loved it. It was oh, very atmospheric. You, I thought it was beautiful. I loved all the locations and the sets and the colours. And, I, I mean, I loved that period anyway. Um, now... I, I thought that the way you portrayed the genuine love between Ina, stroke Lily and Gerda and their ensuing journey of acceptance through this dreadful period was very moving and it, and it really touched me that, you know, that's the heart of the film for me is that it's about these a, a real love between friends. Um, but I wanted to ask you, having read that your mother had seen the play The King's Speech and that had inspired you to make that fantastic movie, um, how did you find out about this story and what made you decide to make the film? Well, um, uh, a bit like The King's Speech, it, it, it came through one of my long-term collaborators, not as long-term as my mum, because that yeah. really is a very long collaboration, <laughs> which no one else can be. The longest. But, but uh, my, my one of cast director, Nina Gold, who cast my first TV commercial when I was 21 and has pretty much cast everything else, and uh, she's just cast Star Wars, so she's doing oh, okay. Wow. Fantastic. And, uh, um, and, and, she, uh, uh, and I was doing the, the usual kind of directorial lament over the telephone, which you've any of you are friends with directors, you'll know it's probably you know it's, it's it's a frequent complaint, which is where are all the great scripts? Why is it so hard to find great writing? And she said, "Well, I know of one great unmade script, and it's called The Danish Girl, written by Lucinda Cox." And and through her, I I I I, I got the script. I read it. It was the best script I'd ever read. I was moved to tears uh, by it repeatedly. And 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 and, and as as you said, it's interesting hearing you talk about it. It's mm. kind of how I felt that first mm. time. It was the love story at the centre that I found. Um, you know, so moving. I mean, almost the, at its centre, at its core, the film is an exploration of unconditional love. Um, so a story about human beings, as opposed yeah. to labelling it as a transgender movie. Yeah, and, and 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 really, it's been a seven-year journey for me to want to move audiences like I was mm. moved by that script. And I and I and I think what's fascinating about the film is you you have to ask what you know how how come Lily emerged then in the nineteen twenties when you know the the word transgender didn't exist when there was no roadmap of transition, when the medical establishment pathologized it as mm. a condition needing locking up or lobotomizing or treating with radiation. And and I think it was because of the, the incredible space opened up by the love in this marriage. Mm. And, and it, and it was a marriage of two artists and, um, you know, Gerda had this kind of extraordinary ability, like many great artists, of 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 to see the the unfamiliar and the familiar, or to or to see beyond the convention. And she she spotted this femininity latent in her husband, and began to explore it in her art. And as a result, began to allow uh, Lilia Zainar to explore that as well. And 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 yet she she loved um, her husband so much that she was willing to support. Lily, uh, you know, throughout the transition, even if there's a risk of losing her, and, mm. and, 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 and that exploration of what love is, which is really truly the ability to put someone ahead of yourself, put their needs ahead of yourself, that's the beautiful core of this film, and, yes. that's, and that's what I celebrate in it. Did you toy with the idea of using a transgender actress uh, as well as um, investigating uh, actors like Eddie Redmayne, who brilliantly portrayed the role. Did yeah. you did you go down that? Route? I mean, I, I I must admit, I you know Eddie was the first instinct I had when I read the script. I mean, I I, I literally couldn't help imagining Eddie in this role, and I, you know I'd already worked with him when he was twenty two years old and Elizabeth the first with Helen Mirren and Jeremy Irons, and Eddie played a young rebel who who gets sentenced to death for trying to overthrow Queen Helen Mirren. This is obviously not a good idea to rebel against Helen no. Mirren, and um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and to this day I remember this moment when he played that scene of receiving the death sentence and it, his his emotional rawness and fragility was was extraordinary it was like nothing i'd seen in an actor and so i kind of wanted to find the right thing for him we did les mis and i look at empty chairs empty tables and i think that's one of my highlights the scene where you know the, the maris is sort of central song in that 
uh, in that film. I mean, you know, I did I did do an outreach to the, the trans acting community in London where the film was based, and um, uh, as a result of that, I met Rebecca Root and Jake Graff, who both uh, play small roles as cis, you know, play cisgender roles, even though they're, they're uh, trans actors, uh, and they became quite useful advisors to Eddie. Um, uh, in the making of it, but I was I was struck that you know the community of trans actors in London is quite small, and one of the things I wonder is if you're a a, a teenager who falls in love with acting, or a child, you know, six year old who falls in love with acting, um, uh, and 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 you know you you are trans. Do 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 you do you feel like you can go after that as a choice in your career with the same confidence a cisgender a person can? I, I'm not sure we've got to that point where people feel that that you know they can have a career in acting with the same sort of uh, equality of opportunity as um, uh, as a cisgender, you know, young actor. So, so you know, I do think the industry's got more to do to broaden the pool of talent and opportunity. We saw uh, Rebecca Root in Boy Meets Girl comedy. Mm-hmm. Just brilliant. Yeah. Such a great actress as well. Mm. I wanted to ask you more about how you developed the the way you portrayed Lily. Mm. So this is a true story, and then. Um, the main character, the the real person, did keep diaries, mm. so there was a lot of information there. Um, but obviously, it's nineteen twenty six, so there probably isn't much film or recording. So then it was a, a book, mm. and then it was a screenplay. So, I mean, how true to the original person and the way he behaved as he was transitioning into Lily, if you like, is your portrayal? That's what I want to know. Mm, How true mm. to the original person is it? So the the film is based on a novel by yes. David Evershoff, who's a who's a New York um, uh, author who wrote the novel in the in the late nineties, um, and he did a certain amount of research. I mean, it, interestingly, that you know, the, the, there there was not a lot of material readily available even in two thousand eight when I started researching it. Um, so Lucinda and and in the novel. I mean, it's 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 I would say quite highly fictionalized. I mean, for mm. example, Gerda is is Greta, and she's actually a Californian who who and there's a whole sort of Californian odyssey where she goes back during the First World War, uh, uh, and he at the end says this is highly fictionalized, that, um, but it, but it still takes some you know key aspects from the real story. Lucinda Coxon, the right the the screenwriter, actually moved it a lot closer to the real story by embracing them both as Danish by making you know their art much closer to the real art um and then and then we commissioned some new uh research to help us um get it uh, even uh more accurate i mean one of the one of the things that was quite challenging was when we went into it, we found for example the diaries that you mentioned. Mm. You know, are based on memoirs written by Lily, but then we then found out that the the, the editor had a hand in them. The you know the mm. potentially the surgeon even wrote some of it. So so they 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 they're not fully authoritative, um, and all the and then of course because of you know the operation happening in Dresden and Dresden being wiped out in the Second World War, the medical records mm. you know pretty much have been burnt and and disappeared. So so. Um, it was it was quite difficult to get to you know even if I wanted to do like a true version mm. I'm not sure there was enough information to ever allow me to say that uh, I, I I I would say you know that there's a lot about it that's that's true the the the, ma- the major license we took was compressing the time frame you know I think in reality the transition. Uh, happened over more years, mm. but it was a little analogy to the King's Speech. I remember, I remember the King's Speech had tightened the time frame of the relationship between Logue and Bertie, and and and, I, and I, at one, I remember trying to unpick it and expand it over the number of years it actually happened. And it's it's it, it's quite hard in single mm. film structures to do that because you have to keep interrupting, saying, and now two years later, and yeah, and, I think you know, we, all, we all understand. Yeah, that, so that was probably that was probably one of the main things, and then also. Um, you know, the real Gerda ended up marrying a, an Italian diplomat, moving to Morocco. That spit up, that ended after three years, leaving mm. her, di- and he took all her money, which was rather awful, and left her destitute in Copenhagen. And that was not part of the. I didn't want to get into that because I felt like that wasn't the love of her life. It felt like the love of her and life. And in was real really... life, didn't they have a menage a trois with with his childhood friend? Mm. I read somewhere. Possibly. That, that that's. But I mean, that's again, a good. I mean, even even the, you know, Gerda's bisexuality, which on the internet is talked about as a fact, 
it's mm. very hard to find anything that's substantiated. I suppose you have to pick a, a point yeah, and then yeah. take the parts of the story that, that illustrate that point. And I think the thing that the, 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 the thing story. we zoned in on and Lucinda zoned in on was, was the love story. Tom, it's great meeting you today. <laughs> um, Thank you. I can't wait to see the movie. It's out on the 1st of January and uh, I wish you all the best at the premiere tonight Thank you. as well. Thanks Thanks very much. Good Thank luck. You. Thanks well for chatting to us. Thank you.